three group lessons once, so I, they did a workshop with me. Uh, you know, and I think, you know, don't go around saying what you learned from Maxine Benguerov because you went to see him once given <laughs> master class, you know. And so I had, oh, Rebecca, you know, yes, oh, I used to learn from you. Oh, yeah, it's very nice, you know. And I realised afterwards that you really did learn. From yeah, no, I did, yeah. I mean, oh, my goodness. But it was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time. I, I looked different as well. Me from when I was three, I was long hair, blue eyes. Sure. So yes. Yes, yes, you were very blonde. Yeah, okay. long hair, blue eyes. You alright? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. ready to go. We're recording. Recording now? Okay. So, um, one of the things about um, the actual instrument, naming the parts of the instrument, which causes a lot of difficulties that there's been historically so many names given to so many different things. And that for parents is really confusing. So I might give you a few names, but I'm just telling you the best thing is book one, there it is. It, these are the names they give, right? So on the whole, we're going to stick to that because that's something they've got in practice. So you do need to make sure that your parents know the names and I'm just going to read them out. You're all violinists, but it's more like it, this is my selection, if you like, of names. Don't start telling them about purpling and about bee sting connections on the corner and, and whether it's one piece back or two piece back. You know, that's just not in the, necessary for them or indeed you. But they do need to know that a scroll is a scroll. So that's one of the names you have to be clear about. And you do have to be clear about the pegs, because you've got to refer to them, even though it's a, probably negatively. Please don't touch the pegs this week. But you need to say the pegs are in a peg box. So that's something that's not listed here. The pegs are in a peg box. Why? Because the peg box is actually the f almost the first place to have an accident when you are little, because people squeeze the pegs in too tight. The tapering is not correct. So you know about that. We'll talk about that as we go. But the peg box on a full-size violin is quite chunky, you know, it's two centimetres wide with fairly decent slabs of wood each side, right? If you understand fractional, in, fractional instruments are very misleading to all of us because we think a half size violin is a half, and that quarter is a quarter, but it's really not, is it? If you think of it, here's a full size. If I get a quarter, then a quarter would be this size. So we have simply said, this is a full size and this is a three quarter. It's not a three quarter, it's our name for it. And it's our name for a half, which I brought you here. Wait. Oh, sweetheart, it could be weight. Somebody will say it's weight, and somebody will say it's actually, um, you can do it, work it out mathematically, because it's cubic metric. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. I'm just taking it from the point of view of parents' point of view. Yeah. You know, just say, it's, we, call, we call it a three-quarter. And in fact, I even more complicated, because nearly all my violins are handmade, and they're sort of, you know, like, I don't know, like Christian Louboutin shoes. They're, 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 they're all made to measure for somebody, so every single increment of millimetres I've got in my violins, and I've just decided arbitrarily to call this a three-quarter. And I do it because I go to violin makers and I say, what do you call a three-quarter? And the Australian S S Suzuki Association, and the Violin Association has put out measurements. So that's one of the things you all have to know, and that is how to measure a violin. We're just going to finish the names as we go down. They will need, need to know that that's a fingerboard, right? They will need to know that's a neck, because we're going to use that. So label it as a neck. Then they, they're going to need to know that this is the top of the violin. Some people call it the table. Here it's called the top. I, I was always brought up to believe it was the table, but let's keep the Suzuki word. If you can, keep the Suzuki word for obvious reasons. One of the things uh, they call this, this little bar at the end, they call that a nut. And I would add end nut to that. So I'm really editing book one at this point. Um, simply because most people think of this as the nut. So this
this is the end nut, and it's called a nut because it's actually made out of chestnut or walnut, out of a nut tree, right? And it's, so it's nothing like as hard as ebony. This is made out of ebony. And it's worth, during those first lessons, when you've got the child there and the parent there, and he or she's got as far as taka taka taka, and they clapped and they danced the rhythm and they're being awfully good and they're going to group lessons, but what the hell are you going to do? You've got another 15 minutes on the clock, you know? <laughs> it's really good to have some of this up your sleeve. Not, this is going to be the lesson I'm going to tell you everything about the violin maintenance, but just, let's just look at the pace today, what they do, how they work. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And why do I say to you, don't, please touch the pegs, right? I very, very rarely in my teaching say don't or can't or, you know, I really avoid negative languages. I, I use stop, very often stop is quite a useful word because it's kind of neutral. But I don't just say take care of the pegs. I say don't touch the pegs. Just as on the bow I'm going to say don't touch the hair. And I'm going to tell my parents, it's very unusual for me to use this language, so really hear it when I say don't, you know, so it's just, you know, it's full of problems. So the tinier the violin, the less this works, at least from the point of view of being solid. Suzuki's tried to do something about that, you might have noticed, you might not, and that is his peg box for the 16th size are bigger than anybody else's than the old German or French 16th size bar. I mean, when he came to design his 16th, and it was Suzuki himself, it, with his dad in the factory that designed that, and you'll notice the pegs really chunky. If I took a photograph of a Suzuki 16th and gave it to you, just without a little matchbox, and said, what do you think this is? You'll say, oh, I think it's Suzuki. Suzuki violin, it was probably a 16th or an 8th. You'd be able to tell because it's just kind of geared for children. He was so clever that way. If you come to my house and you see my violins, I hope some of you might come to the place recital on Thursday, and there on my, I've got the little tiny ones, the little 16th, and they're all virtually unplayable because all of this is so tiny. But still delicate, that's what I'm really getting through to my parents. I always keep my violins in silk. Um, I just, you know, I mean, whatever, just cotton spun. I use silk because silk on wood is just like endlessly polishing it. So every time it pops in and out, it's, it's being given a polish. Do you see what I mean? I get these made in Vietnam and they're about 50 pence each, but you know, I mean, you can make your own or they can make their own. Um, just avoid anything like dusters or anything mm -hmm. like that is absolutely hopeless. They catch with the rosin, they catch with the springs and so on. So chin rest is a chin rest. And underneath that, and I use Kate's shoulder pads, these are shoulder pads. They're not shoulder rests. A lot of people say shoulder rest. And I've had parents go to Kensington Music Shop for a, a coon shoulder rest. Or no, they said, yeah, they said a coon chin rest. The mother went for a chin She didn't rest. know. You know, and they said, no, we don't, they don't have them. And she came back, no, the coon doesn't make chin rest. And I think, I think she'd heard somewhere that this was a shoulder rest. And a chin, chin rest, rest, shoulder rest. She thought it was the same thing, you know. They, they don't know anything at the beginning. And I had to really sit down and say, this is a chin rest, chin rest. Some people say it's a jaw rest, but I'm going to stick to chin rest. This is a chin rest, and this is a shoulder pad, a shoulder pad. <laughs> yeah, that's very important to be very clear. I use these, you can buy these so easily, and you know, it's e-cloth, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, this is, as you see, pretty filthy. Um, but I use it pretty well all the time. My violin's over there. I have it taken to Charles Bear once a year, and it costs a thousand pounds, nearly, usually about 860 or 900, and they 
put two double sets of glasses on like this and they have a sable brush which has got one hair in it and they go through it like this. Okay, so we're not going to do that. But basically, the best way of looking after violence is on the daily basis, is how you handle it. So one of the things Charles Burr said to me right at the beginning when I had this violin, he said, never let anybody touch the varnish. You know, so you've got to really get used to that. When you've got a little violin, like a Suzuki violin, you know, you're saying to yourself, oh, it's just shellac. You know, I could practically put fairy liquid on it. I mean, what's the big deal? But you're teaching them for the future, and you're teaching the parents for the future. So how you pick up the violin is really important, and it has to be trained for. I mean, if that was a teddy bear, you know, if that was whatever, my, my new doll, you know, I do, I put my hands on it. So parents and children have to learn the scroll is safe as anything, yeah? Why? Because it's got no varnish on it. Well, actually Suzuki does have varnish on it because he puts the shellac protection on everything, but if you look at Stradivarius, it's not varnished there. <laughs> and here, so basically you want to hold the violin like this or this. I mean, there are many other possibilities, and this is one of my favorites, is being able to pick up a violin really quickly like that. Um, or that, you know, it's really handy to have the children and the parents hold it like that because it's extremely safe, yeah? Or hold it like that, like that. When you <coughs> see professionals have professional photographs, you always see, well, if you have them with the violin, they usually have the violin, you always see with the fingers over the fingerboard because the fingerboard is ebony and that you really can wash with fairy liquid. I'm not an advocate, that's too many <laughs> But I'm saying it is hard as nails. You can do anything with the fingerboard, really. So fingers like that. Every now and again, you see somebody who's been given a professional photograph, and you see their fingers here. That's somebody who is very, very ignorant. You do not put your hands here. So you don't get children used to having you know, fingers here. When they're tiny and they're in rest position, Right? There's nothing to hurt the violin. Put the thumb here, fingers over the fingerboard, not here. Yeah? And anyway, that's where you want it to put up the violin so that it moves the elbow this way. So it actually makes technical sense, you understand what I'm saying, rather than putting it up with the neck. The, such a temptation from the human perspective. I've got this like a handbag sticking out here, and I've got somehow to get this instrument over here. So if I was like just thinking conducively, you know, like what would be the easiest for me, I would do something like that. This is what children and parents want to do. This after all, they see this, they perceive this as a handle. Do you see what I mean? So that's bad technique from our point of view. So you have to really train for the maintenance of violin to hold it, pick it up like that, very important. And this doesn't have to be a bag, it could be something over it. But I think it's really important to show physically in the lesson, this is not a group lesson, jolly game. This is a very intimate, quiet, you have to be really calm to be able to do it. You'll probably all be sitting on the floor for this job. I don't encourage children to put their violins away on, on chairs or tables, you know, Keep, it, I'm talking about little children, three, four, five, six little children on the floor. It's safer, they're safer, and they learn how to put it away and how to tuck it in, you know, so that it goes in nicely. Sometimes it has a tie here or whatever. Show them with their own case how to do it. And which do you put in first, the violin or the bow? You know, there's all these kind of rules, but it's well worth really training them. In my school, I put the case and make sure it's on the floor, make sure it's open like that, and I put the bow in first. The bow, for various reasons, gets sat on and pushed out <laughs> from the side. So, you know, we d we're not thinking of the bow, we're thinking of the violin, so we, we very often are little accidents there. So you put the 
the bow in first? Do you put the tip in first? Do you put the other, you know, how do you do it? Do you do it with one hand, two hands? Does mummy do it 100% at the beginning? Yes, probably, yeah? But this is your skill, is to show the parent physically how to do it. And every parent can do it. So these lessons actually are quite attractive to parents. Do you see what I mean? Because for a change, they feel, my God, I get this, I, I can do this. And you say you put the tip, this is the tip of the bow, and it goes in, you know, that there, and then you put this, and then you click, and you feel this, and you, you know, it's a little click, or you all have different ways of, of doing it, but you've got to do it according to what you're presented with, which, which case you're presented with. Um, case is another whole subject. Um, one of the things I'm not allowed to do is use any kind of cleaner, because I brought it, and I do have to use it because I have a rental business, and I rent out at the moment about 100 or so violins throughout, probably some here, most likely, I don't know. Anyway, if they've got a little catalogue number, <laughs> that'll be one of my violins. I mean, I don't even know because I've got somebody who does, does it for me, you know. Because that's already remedial. This is a cleaner, so why do you need a cleaner? Essentially, you see, the, the optimum is you don't need a cleaner because you're just wrapping it up in that. You never touch it anyway. And as I learned actually from Suzuki, if you do have anything that you want to perhaps, you know, in this area you want to clean off, the, one of the best products in the world is free and that's human tears. Human tears come from the eyes, they've been already filtered, it's perfect water and it's just got a tiny touch of salt in it. I don't know if you've ever drunk your own tears or washed in your own tears. I have! <laughs> and that's just a tiny little acerbic, so a couple of tears here works fine. So if ever a child cries in the lesson, I go, oh, well, that's very useful because we can, we can use that <laughs> to clean the violin. Okay. And it's, it's just one of the things you can have up your sleeve, you know, it's a joke, but actually it's not a joke, actually tears, a couple of tears are just about right, and tear is a good word because you only want that much, right? So what happens is you get a build up here, as you know, when you look at old violins, and by the way my collection comes from the oldest, most terrible places in the world, you know, sort of car boot sales and eBay and the back of an envelope and you know whatever so they've nearly always been in really bad condition so I've learned a lot about that and I've learned a lot with my friends who repair things and here I can, can I'm not going to open it all for you don't need it but there's a powder here you know like if you do need to clean it you get a, a well this this kind of cloth would be fine actually You'd have to take off the bridge and, and the tailpiece, of course. And then little tiny movements like that. That's, that's remedial. That means something's gone wrong over the last 50 years, okay? Because there's been a build-up of rosin. The most in, obvious reason there's been a build-up in rosin, and that is, particularly with Suzuki children, they usually play here. By the way, I don't use this red. That comes from Roxana, I use a yellow. It doesn't matter, that's your twinkle tape. And parents go like that, you see, they think, in fact, why wouldn't you? My child only plays here. And actually, I think you've had this lesson from me already. You hold the bow here, you put your finger over the, this is called a ferrule, we'll do a bow in a minute, because it's got sharp edges. So you put your finger like that over that, right? You get your rod in, you've got some rod in here, doesn't matter, imagine the rod in. Right, and you do it here where it's quite tense, and you do here while it's quite tense. Here, it's not tense at all, right? So you rod in here, you slip through, and you rod in here, and you slip through, and rod in here, and you rod in here. You don't rod in there at all. So as you play, by osmosis, all that lovely white powder that you created just gradually goes into the middle, and so you've got a smoothly well furnished bow, well rosined. And then when you play, you won't have that cloud. I can remember when I was little, I had 
absolutely love that cloud. It made me feel very <laughs> professional. I don't know if I was nine or ten or something, but you know, when I was capable of rosining my own bow, but I had an instruction, so of course I went to the middle. Why wouldn't you? I mean, come on. So go to the middle and then play and oh, wow, so much practice. And I'd show my mother, look how much practice I've done today. And I was always congratulated for that white powder. Well, anyway, you don't really want that white powder. It's not good for the violin. So the minute you see that white powder, you get one of your little cloths off and you wipe it off. You see what I mean about maintenance being on a day-to-day -day basis. It's an attitude of how you look after your violin and bow. And then you'll find there isn't such a thing as maintenance. That, you know, there aren't so many accidents. Um, bow, it's, this is really easy, but again, I, I used to call this a frog. Some people call it a heel, I call it a frog. It is frog here, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's got frog or heel. Right. <laughs> it's, it's got the frog or heel. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Choose whatever Kate tells you. Like, what do you use? Either. Either. I just say frog. The reason I don't answer either, Kate, is that parents don't use two. They're going to use one for everything. You know, so it's occasionally, um, I have to say, to be honest with you, I get in a muddle where it comes to semi quavers because when they start, I call them 16th notes and 8th notes. And then I have to say, by the way, I'm now going to tell you, because you're doing grade 3 or something, that they're semi <laughs> um, So, you know, yes, I do use two. But I'm very careful. I don't say, use either. I say, this is what you use now. And then we'll change it. Anyway, a tip's a tip. That's called the facing. Very often comes off. Um, be very careful about gluing anything. You, you don't want any do-it-yourself things. So take anything you possibly can into the nearest um, luthier you know and say, you know, what shall I use? They, they use for that a kind of glue. But again, it's based on the idea that this would be ivory or silver. Yeah, and in fact, you know, they're all plastic now. Um, and that's not silver either. This is, this is, this is the ferrule here. So, how do you spell that? F-E-R-R-U-L-E. -R -R -E. Ferrule. And it's actually, it's a new concept, Kate, because they didn't have them in Bach's day. Mm. There wasn't a ferrule. And that's why it, it's all very um, smooth and baroque bow. is very light at the frog and light at the tip. So it's sort of the same if you do baroque style. I'm sure you all play in baroque one way or another. So you know what I mean, it's sort of very even, whereas this is like powerful, mega powerful down here, and really with a good bow hold, mega powerful here. And in Baroque you don't have that at all. This, this is very light, and this is very, very light, as you know, so more it's evenly like distributed, yeah? Um, it's like the little brushes. That's called the lapping, as you see my lapping's broken. And then there's the thumb pad, which is here, which is, oh, they call it a grip. Okay, so I've got to be careful about that. Anyway, I, I suggest that you're going to use those, so I, you found me out already. I, I actually call that the lapping, and they call it the grip, so I'm going to call it the grip from now on. So basically, the only thing we changed when we did, because it's in our three simple steps, is going through that, is the adjuster. Because hardly anyone here calls it the adjuster. I can't even remember what they call it in that fine tuner. The fine tuner. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody calls it an adjuster. Yeah. So I do teach my kids to say. Um, but this says string adjuster. adjuster. No, it doesn't. It says fine tuner. Oh, oh right. I thought it did. I thought it was one of the good things. <laughs> it is. Fine tuner. You're quite right. I've got string adjusters crossed. I mean, fine tuner crossed off string adjusters. Um, yeah. But there again, so you see, found me out again, there's another one I don't do. <laughs> um, but the thing is, you be, help use them, use that, and then you be consistent. Not like Kate and me, I mean, or not like me, who's clearly proved to be inconsistent. Um, how do you measure a, a violin? That's another thing, it's, it's really odd, because we measure them now in centimeters. On the other hand, you still talk, even at professional level, of a 16-inch 16 16 viola or a 17-inch viola. 
you know, and a 17 inch viola is like 54 centimeters. I was like, what, what do you mean? It's like ridiculous, but we still use it. So the thing is with this, you have to know where the measurement's from. And, and it is quite tricky. The measurement that you take here is from an imaginary line. Right, this is one end, that's easy. And it goes to here, and this here is the imaginary line there, and that's where you measure it to, not to the end mm -hmm. here. That's a super and the parents should probably. know that because sometimes, well, in fact, nearly always, they include this for students, and then that they, you know, they don't get the right size. Lots and lots of parents um, and children, and it always bothers me, but can't do anything about it, want to have violins that are too big. Um, too big, in my mind, means too heavy. It's not, it's not that that bothers me. It's, it's <coughs> that that bothers me. And too heavy violins, I mean, Suzuki violins are relatively heavy compared to, I mean, you know, Kate, I've got those little tiny ones in my, in my closet there in the front. If you pick them out, pick them up, which we can do on Thursday. It's almost like levitating. I give you one move. <laughs> They're so light, which makes them virtually unplayable. So, you know, you've got to be aware of that. So, they're chunky. I mean, the good ones that are playable are chunky purposely so they won't snap and crack and popple like my handmade ones. You see what I mean? He's very, very clever about that. And so you've got to be really careful. You've got to have really small violins. Um, I think I think lots of professionals should be paying and playing on seven eighths violins, and they're not playing full size violins. But um, the one thing I was going to just share with you was the, the again remedial. I mean, why is it necessary? Why did you, why did I even bring them? Why is this necessary? Why did I bring it? Well, these are things to mend because of misuse. This is peg compound, mm -hmm. right? And some people think that's all part and parcel of being a violinist. You have peg compound. You take the peg out and you put this compound out so that the peg fits the hole. Well, actually, the peg should fit the hole. End of. Yeah? The hole is made in the maple. This is made of maple, which is the same as this. Okay, the peg, no, I'm not saying this peg, this is pretty crappy pegs, but the pegs are typically made of something very hard, like ebony, all the best ones are made of ebony, or rosewood. Very, very hard woods, you've seen. And then, do you see the hard wood goes in to the well, I can't call it soft wood, but medium, right? And then that makes the perfect lane here. You just get right in. It's, it slightly tapers, and it fits. And the more you use it, the better it gets. It just gets smoother and smoother and more and more snug. So people go, oh, you know, it's the weather. <laughs> no, it's just because it's bad workmanship, and you've been putting peg compound on it, which actually is great if I've got a concert to play tonight and my peg's slipping, yes. You know, real emergency measures are emergency measures and we all need to use them. Um, would you then have to clean that off, the peg paste? I, I would clean it off or I would have it rebushed. Rebushing means you go to the, this is what I had for about 20 years. Every time I went to Colin Nichols, my conservator, I'd say rebush. And that, that is, they take the peg out, there's a hole there, they drill a bigger hole, or even a square, so it's usually a circle, it depends on if it's a tiny violin, sometimes it's a square. And you insert a piece of wood and then you re-drill it. Yeah, you do it again, so it's sort of new. And that means the pressure, instead of just being here, is now wider and so you, you find a lot of the old violins are, are being bushed 
that's what it's called. I mean, you don't need to know parents anything to like that, but they need. The, these are because a lot of my um, criminal clients, um, they make such a mess of things. Um, so I, I touch it up with this. So this is like a magic marker. Um, you can do wonders with this. I mean, this comes as a little kit that you can get anywhere. It's for furniture repair, furniture restoring. And it's, it's basically magic marker. It's a, it's a felt tip pen, yeah, but very strong. And it's got all these different colors in it, which is great. And this is the same. This is the same, only stronger. And this is, you know, for these edges here. I don't know what my kids do to their edges, but they're always scraping the edges on here. Zips. It's yeah, all think that kind of thing. So much often that it is. Yeah, they just have to, right from the day one, don't let them go away with the violin and say to yourself, on the second lesson, I'll teach them how to look after it. You know, don't do that. Make sure absolutely draw your breath in. And I explain to the parents right at the beginning, I say this is like nothing. Your child has never had anything like this before in his or her life. It is not a teddy bear. It's not a doll. It's not a tractor. It's not a piece of Lego. You know, it's a very, very precious object. And I always say it's incredibly complicated. So I give them what I can in terms of, you know, helpful handy hints. This stuff is for you when somebody says, I'm in a pickle, I don't know what to do because my violin looks horrible, or if it's your violin, you're buying it for somebody. I always recommend, by the way, if you're starting teaching, that you get some violins yourself. I mean, in fact, exactly what I did, and I know Kate's got lots. And then you rent them out, or give them away. I mean, I, it's, I'm not even trying to raise a market for you here. I'm just saying, it's, it would be really good if you had a few violins, and every violin should, violin teacher should absolutely have a small violin in the studio, um, just in case of accident. It could be a quarter size, which would be too big, but possible for a little one. Quarter size would be too small, but again, possible for even a teenager. You know, just pro tem, rather than say, I haven't got a violin, my violin's broken, I can't use it. Well, that's half an hour. What shall I do? You know, so always have something handy. And really, I beg you to do that. Quarter would be my go-to if I had, but I mean, I'm lucky I've got them all. But taking care of the instrument and, and just every night, you know, wiping it down, wiping it here. I wipe the strings also. Um, this is another thing I do when I have... Um, children in workshops. I don't know if it's going to work because I think they're probably too clean, but we'll see. I take this and see. Now, I've obviously cleaned it, but right, you pull it up, doesn't matter, I pull it out. But you, no, I've cleaned it. So basically, oh, there we are. Can you hear that? That sound that people go <laughs> like this, it's like chalk on a blackboard. People hate that sound. And what is that sound? You can tell me. Rosin stuck. Yeah. It's not just rosin. It's rosin stuck rosin, which does no favours to your bow or your tone. It's not, you see what I mean? If it was just rosin, it wouldn't make any sound it, because you would have just wiped it off. So wiping it off is really, really important. Get the parents to do that. Make a big fuss. If they miss a day, who cares, you know? But seriously, that should be done every day. My mum, my wonderful mum, she taught me so many things, most of which I've learned after she's died. I think, oh, that's right, she told me that before. Anyway, she used to say, um, put the bow into the case after you've loosened it. And if you leave it tight overnight, she said, the bow will start to cry. I must have been five or something. <laughs> it's so painful to the bow to be left tight. <laughs> so I absolutely told all my students this, and 
and I've always said, you know, it's, and I always feel it. I mean, I never, ever leave my bow tie. I just can't do it now because I'm so still. <laughs> I discovered as a grand old age of about 40, I discovered if you've got a decent bow, I mean, it's made of permanent bouquet, you can spend 80 pounds and having it re <laughs> And it'll still last for another five years or something. So, I, but my mother never told me that you could do that. But basically, if it's a cheap bow, you can't do that. You lose the spring. So that's another thing. I would do really carefully. I would show show them how to rosin and show them what you what do you mean by tight? You know, and every bow is different. So, you know, I'm I'm going to start. Oh, this is hopeless. I just grabbed it this morning to show you, but it's actually junk here. Really sorry. So one, two, three, four, five, and then I go, do you see, and I measure, I'm such a bad bow, <laughs> I measure here, I say, do you see you can fit your finger in, or Jimmy's finger in, or something, that's, that's how, that's when you play it, it's that amount, because every bow is different, and you're measuring it from the twinkle tapes, that's where it is, and then when you loosen it, and it's usually five turns, five, I say turns, they're 45 degrees, you see what I mean, they're quarter turns. Usually you can see, this is such a bad example, uh, you can see it is slightly separating. So again, I make an absolute deal of that. I can spend 10 minutes in a lesson on that very thing. Okay, so now Mimi's going to see it. Let's all go and watch her and see if she loosens it. Can you see it separating? Mimi, can you see it separating or not? No, no, I think I did. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, that's separating. Okay, now Joe's going to do it. He's five or something. Joe, this is the screw I've told you already, you know, the bit. Screw. Can you do that, sweetheart? You hold the bow like this. Your right hand is so you do it like this. Your left hand is so you do it like this. It's fine. Learn how to do it. And just see how it works. What does it feel like? Yeah? How does it feel on, on the string? Ooh, I can't play like that, and I put it on there because it's separated. That ooh, that's not that's not a good tone. You see, because they they they're all splitting like that. It's, it doesn't. And now I'm going to tighten. Ah, that's better. So you make a deal out of it. I can't stress that enough. I'm in a very good position to give this talk. It's about the first time anybody's ever asked me to give this talk, and that is because I take back the ones that have been rented, right? And they are shoddy. You see what happens to them. They are shoddy. You know, it, it used to be that they came back to lovely Shamin, my lovely Indian girlfriend who does all the business for me, and then she rents them out again. But she'd say, I'm not sure there's something, you know, not quite right about it. Blinking every single time that they come back with something. She has to bring them back to me, and then I have to go to the conservatory and recover. So I lose money on that, just, but I mean, that's my marketing problem. But you've got to do better than that. You know, don't lose money on this, and make sure the bow is always loosened. Make sure that the children have got good habits. This is group lesson stuff, you know. This looks like a walking stick. You know, you can't really be cross with Jimmy if he's four. And he goes like this, I'm not going to do it because it will spoil the bow, but he goes like this and starts to do this. You know, it's just lack of training. Do you see, because isn't it what you would do if you are four, male or female, wouldn't you just want to tap it on the floor? I mean, I would, I know. Because it looks like a walking stick and everything else that I've had and at school, you, you can do that kind of thing. So you, this is where you've got to go, this tech, look, Look, Mimi, do you see? Can you see? Look, isn't that amazing? Look, and in, in mine, it's made of ivory, but this is very light ivory. You know, look, isn't it beautiful? I mean, this is cheap as chips, this, but I can still do that lesson. You know, just look at the beauty of that, my God, and look at that tape. Do you see how thin that is? Oh, my God, you've got to take such care of that. Yeah, and you do this literally from the first lesson to the tenth lesson. Just keep on and on. And I do it in, in workshops. I go like this and I go, oh, what a lovely bow. 
all one is lucky, you know. It's a beautiful violin. And because uh, I do actually say that honestly, because every violin to me is absolutely beautiful. People often say, which is your favourite? Well, obviously my own is my favourite because it's mine. But, uh, you know, I, I fall in love with violins like I can fall in love with people. I mean, they are all essentially, you know, replicas of something that's so profoundly beautiful and wonderful and, and, and nobody, and so mysteriously wonderful. Um, just going to do a little buzz check with you. Have we got time? No, we haven't got time. Is there time left? Any no. time we've got? No, we've got time. Anyway, there's a buzz checklist and things to do when you know, things go wrong. But basically, I'm trying to encourage you as teacher trainees not to let anything go wrong. So, you know. Uh, you could do five more minutes actually because, um, well, I'll explain in a minute. Okay. Um, buzz checklist. I've got a buzz on my violin. What is it? Um, you don't need to write this down. You just really have to use your common sense. But you start with the body. You know, do I have my glasses hanging around here, dropping earrings? You know, I'm sure that's absolutely fine. But you know what I mean. You'd look, you'd look, zips. and zips. Yeah, <laughs> buttons. You know, obviously you're going to start there. But just, but you get really quick at it. I mean, don't waste time and it. Just go. Dur -ra -ra -ra. I can just see straight away that it's not Kate's problem. You see what I mean? Just shh. so find, get quicker at little. It's, it's often on things like that, Ed. When it when the when the tiny little button that you don't even use yeah. is, <laughs> is open there, yeah. and you you honestly you didn't even really know it was there because you never shut it. You know. Anyway, it goes without saying. I'm going to say something like that. Okay. Now, when it comes to, I'm just going to do them in order as I see round. This chin rest on here, as soon as I start playing, if I press down here, which is, this one's okay, but if I press down here, you might easily find that it touches the tailpiece. So this is where you've got to be really nippy. And you can see, I'm very careful when I put the chin rest on to make sure there's enough space there. So all the Suzuki ones are Fine from that point of view, but very often you find that the tail piece is a little too high and it gets in the way of the chin. So you've got to sort that out. Um, you can use that non stick stuff to put in between, like rubbery. Okay, you could put blue tack. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of things that comes under the, the remedial, mm -hmm. which of course I don't want you to really think of that as part of violin maintenance. I mean, I appreciate what you say, Kate, but even better is, you know, getting it right first time. Um, I can see straight away, this is called the tail gut, this, this gut here, right? I can see tip straight away that tail gut is too loose. There's too much space between the end here, the end of the tail piece, and this purpling here. It should be further this way. And it could be, in fact, and almost certainly, it was because Colin did it, it was because it was touching the chin rest. So that's a very, very common one, the chin rest touching the tailpiece. Okay? Other very, very common ones are these little veins. They're too loose. So it's this is tricky because you want these to be as loose as possible. Now, possible is the most important word here. As loose as possible, therefore, they've got still to be able to tug. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The tug is the word that you use for getting the screw into its screw. Um, and they use the word tug there, carpenters use that. So you've got to have the tug still. And these are not all the same. This one's lost its tug here because it's been badly handled. So that's again, get your children to use these correctly. Show the parents how to do it. And it's very, I didn't pick this with anything in mind other than I just suddenly grabbed at them and thought, I don't want to be doing this on my violin. I want to, or I don't have time to do it with yours. So I just grabbed it this morning, literally like that. So I didn't realize. Now, why has it lost its thread? Not totally, but nearly lost its thread. Because it's been over screwed. So that's, that's again, 
time, it's money, it's boring. You have to have the whole thing of buy, you can't buy a new screw by the way, you have to buy a new tip, whip the tail piece, which is another 20 pounds. And if you want somebody to push it on for you, that's another 20 pounds. So, you know, by the time you, you know, you are you losing money on all this. So make sure that they know how to screw these. And this is the parents' territory now, this. So many parents have this ridiculous idea. As soon as it's, say, April or May, they go, oh, it's out of tune because it's so hot. And then, you know, first slide of wind in October, they say, oh, it's out of tune because it's so cold. You know, these are not like in the old days when they were made of sheep's gut. These strings are made of, you know, what they put pearl on inside and silver outside. They are not sensitive to the weather, I can promise you. Um, they are sensitive to bad use. Then they don't like being used badly. So that's, that's what's happened, is that the, they've over-screwed it. Because it's something you have to tell parents and you have to kind of see the common sense of this. Strings only get lower. They don't wave around. They don't get higher and lower. Do you understand? In using a string, in playing a string, if it's in tune on Monday, it's a brand new string. On Tuesday, it'll be out of tune. Wednesday, it'll really be out of tune. Brand new string. It will be lower. They, lots of people, even teachers, don't understand that. So that means when you've got a new string, you're always tightening it clockwise, like this. And then, you know what I mean by Gillen, it's one of her old pals. Okay, Gillen's a professional violinist in his mid 40s, dare I say, I don't know how old he is. He's married to a professional violinist in her mid 40s. They've got a <coughs> child called Blake who's got my violin, right? And they return the violin, it's an absolutely gorgeous violin. The G string was so far down, and I'm not kidding you, these are professional parents, were so far down that they were actually screwing it into the violin. Luckily, it had varnish on it, um, you know, rather thick. It wasn't a Suzuki violin, it was a nice one, but it had varnish on it. So when I took it all off, I could see that there was a sort of white varnish had, had gone. It was a pinprick, in other words, but I mean, didn't they notice? I mean, can't believe it. They must have really screwed it into the wood. I mean, come on. So if they didn't do it, believe me, nobody will. It. You've got to know, all right? So when you have your new student with a new violin, and by the way, they go to a rental place, stringers or whatever you use, you don't know if it's new strings or not, right? Yeah, probably not. So you've got to tell them, or you've got to change here so what you do is lower all these to the lowest and then quick as a flash, change them all here. You don't even need to tune it. Honestly, I, well, I'm so experienced now, I just do it. I know how much to turn it. Not much, in other words, but you just go ding, 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 ding. And then you readjust it here. Okay? So remember, that's the only way that they're going to be tuning, is sharpening it. Once they get into the head the wrong idea, it's very difficult to change. Parents have this idea that you go either way. I'll try this way, didn't sound right, so I'll try the other way. That still didn't sound right, so I'll try the other way again. Which way was it? And also, you know, I've got plenty of parents that can't do clockwise. I say, I say righty tighty, lefty loosey, this is yep. the old carpenter's thing, so, you know, do you know your right, do you know your left? I don't know, anyway, I teach parents righty tighty. I've got it from a carpenter. I mean, it's Middle Ages stuff. <laughs> but true. do you see, Kate, how, what I'm really trying to say in this lesson? Mm -hmm. Do you get it? I just want you to be really sensitive about these things. Violin strings, like E strings, cut through bridges. Bridges are made of sycamore. Sycamore is even softer than maple. The idea being, if I crash into it, I don't want to break the maple, I break the bridge, which is easy because it's an accessory. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's 
why you have to know this, this is the softest part, this is the next soft part, then you go to this part, and finally you end up with the, the fingerboard, which is like metal practically, it's so hard, yeah? That's also very, very strong, it's usually ebony. Um, and then the end nut is not ebony, remember it's made from nut, which is semi-hard, you know, it's, it's not by accident, that's the same as the top. Yeah, maple. Spruce. Spruce. It's part of the spruce maple family. There's, again, there's different words for it, but, you know, we, we usually call it maple. Um, cutting apples, what was I going to say? Um, e string. It cuts through like, um, you know, I used to have a cheese cutter like that. Okay. So you would never leave the e string without any kind of bridge protector. But here, there's another, another thing you can easily see, is that the bridge protector's been put on wrong. <laughs> because the bridge protector's been put on 50-50, a lot of people mm. do that, that's a mistake. You want to have the bridge protector this side, and then just stop it on the bridge like that. Mm -hmm. Now you'll see, I've got my lovely Colin Nichols does all my violins, and he always puts a bridge protector on the bridge. That, that's one of the things he does. He cuts it like that and he refills it with harder and then he puts a bit of leather on it. So I, all mine are protected, but most of them aren't, the Suzuki ones aren't. So you've got to be clear about that. You've got to have a bridge protector, but you mustn't have it over there. Why? Why shouldn't you? Because it would work out if it's over the bus. Or even worse. I mean, yes, it could rattle. Why wouldn't you have bridge protector half and half? Mm. So that would be like two mils each side. Yes. I mean, it stops it vibrating, doesn't it? You want uh, you want that E, yeah. You want that you want that E to be able to go right through the bridge, don't you? I mean, that's the, you know, that lesson you've also had from me how the violin works. So the, that's got to be available, right? And if it's if it's got a bridge protector here, the string won't work anyway, like anyway, the bow will get in the way. Okay, buzzing is very common here. Um, Cassin, my lovely boy, who's gone off to Birmingham University, sent me a message last week. I still got it in the telephone. Here, I think it is, this is the most common place for all the all opening. You all you're all professional violins, you all know what I mean. An opening. Why is it? Why is it so common there? And what is an opening? Okay, Mimi, what's an opening? Um, it's, it's when the, the ribs come away from the yeah. back or in front. Exactly. So mm -hmm. the it is, uh, buzzes. So yeah. you play the violin somewhere up here, they're in the middle of their grade five and they suddenly can't play a, a note in fourth position. Why? And it's because it started to open here. Or they can't play the first finger on the G string. Why? Because it's open. But the, he, who's now 19, gone away to university and got one of my violins, which is worth 10,000, so it's a really important violin. He's on a music scholarship and I want him to have something nice. He sent me a message, absolute, complete panic. <laughs> complete panic. Because he had opened it here. So he thought it was all crap. I went, relax, babe. <laughs> violins are designed to open. They're just made with you know, this cow gum. I mean, they're made with this special kind of glue that doesn't really glue them. That's the whole point, is that it's very flexible glue and it dries and it's wet. I mean, it, that, that is, succumbs to weather. That's true. And, and, but you never need worry about wet weather. England is fine from the point of view of violin maintenance. The wood loves temperate climates. The, the enemy, our enemy, and I include everybody in this room, our enemy is underfloor heating or radiators. That's our enemy. Because dried violins are really bad news. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of moisture in here. Mm -hmm. And if you dry it out, it becomes dust, literally dust on the floor. That's a dried out piece of wood, it's dust. 
So the very fact that it's got its own shape shows that it's got quite a lot of moisture in it, right? It's not something you first think of in environment, like it wet or something. But I remember Charles Bear says, so, oh, nobody gets this, they don't, they think it's, it, you know, terribly, terribly worrying me because there's a lot of rain around. He said, it's the best possible thing. He said, you can even go and sh into your shower with the violin. It's not true exactly, but you can take a violin into a shower room. Nothing much is going to happen. Nothing much is going to happen in the shower room. You know, yes, it will, it, it, you know, it might, some of the glue might pop, but I mean, so I'm not advocating it, but dryness. I mean, that, and that's, like the back of a car, in the trunk of a car, and then you go out shopping and you leave it in Sainsbury's car park for two and a half hours, oh my God. And you pick it up and the outside of the case is hot mm -hmm. to touch. And that's happened so often. So those, those are things you just got to continually talk about, but not negatively in a sense like you've done wrong, because parents, I mean, why wouldn't they put the violin in your case and put it into the trunk of the car? After all, they put, they've just been to Sainsbury, they put apples there, they put milk there, they put tent pegs there, they put, you know, whatever, yoga outfits there, why shouldn't I put my violin there? So, you know, very often when I'm talking to you, um, I'm trying to make my point, but I don't want you to offload it in terms of shame to the parents. It's ignorance, yes, absolute ignorance, but your job is to train them. You have to keep training them. It's not a one-off. Okay. I have one question. When you have blackened fingertips from the strings... means that you haven't cleaned them off. So what should you be cleaning? Just wiping them like that? Or well, is actually, it, it's a very interesting question, because if you do play and you have black, two things. One is, it's happened to me, it's happened to you, because you've done two hours of violin practice straight off, and you look and you go, oh my God, my fingers are so black. More likely that there is certain uh, human moisture, you know, from your, the sort of oil, we call it here, that you've left on the strings, you haven't cleaned them off. Cleaning the strings off with, with a little tiny, with this, Eau de Cologne works brilliantly. And Just basically alcohol. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Vodka. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the best. See, your water house is always spitting on her yeah. thing. And then that's yeah. um, exactly. cleaning every string with a bit of spit. Yeah. Well, exactly. So cleaning it with that. Um, it, it, but again, if you clean it off every time, you clean your <coughs> it off every time. And that's why, you know, the bag helps because it's sort of gently, you know, infiltrates and rubs it. Put silver in the strings as well, isn't it? Silver oxidizer. Silver oxidizer, yeah. Mm. Um, I would say though, if you had a child who's black, I would say immediately that child is squeezing. Probably it's got a sweaty hand, okay? Mm. But let's say it doesn't have a sweaty hand. Let's say it's a, and this has happened to a 17 year old student I have called Beatrice, who is just on her diploma. She has black fingers every time and the reason I'm sorry to say, bad teacher, is that she was squeezing the fingerboard instead of squeezing the string when she plays. She was just using too much tension all the time. You can actually hear it in her slides, they're too noisy, and her shifts are too jumpy and, and, and so on, and her you know, double stopping is not easeful because she can't do one finger on two because it's always so tight. So, you know, that's my job, I've got to kind of relax her. So when you play the violin, you don't want to hammer down on the strings. I mean, that's a te technical thing. You, I learned that lesson very strongly from my daughter, Imogen, who got a double bass when she was 11. And we realized when you play the double bass, you don't go anywhere near the fingerboard. It's really interesting for a violinist to play the double bass. Because then you realize you're playing the string. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You play the string. It's the string you're stopping, and the string you're stopping. You don't go anywhere near, I mean, from the fourth finger, it's about that far to the fingerboard. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So I always say you're, you, you're stopping the string, you're not stopping the fingerboard, yeah? Just so that there's less tension in there. 
I'm sure I said that to you when you were little. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so now we have private lessons, level one was with Helen. So you've only got two here, and um, Kit, I'll let you explain about the violin. Um, so if we do till about 10 past, and then we'll just have a slightly shorter lunch break. And yeah, we'll fine, break. absolutely but fine. Yeah, real lunch. So, no, we're in um, group room two to do vibrato with me. And do you um, uh, ask any, any questions at lunch? I'm a fanatic violin collector. And 